them at all? Is it time to get rid of all of it, quite frankly? And artificial intelligence, do you even know what that is? If you do, are you someone that celebrates it, saying, yes, it's going to help us? Or are you on the other side that say, whoa, 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 be careful what you wish for, what on earth have we unleashed? We'll get into all of that and more. But before we do, let's make sure we're up to speed with tonight's latest headlines. Michelle, thank you. Well, the top story this hour, as you've been hearing, the Metropolitan Police says one person has been arrested after a car crashed into the gates of Downing Street in London. Armed officers arrested the man on suspicion of criminal damage and dangerous driving. There are no reports at this stage of any injuries and inquiries are ongoing. This is a developing story. More details as we get it right here. GP News. Now, in other news today, Number 10 has refused calls for Rishi Sunak to apologise despite failing to reduce net migration, which has now risen to record levels. ONS data shows migration numbers rose to 606,000 last year, even after repeated government pledges to bring overall numbers down. The Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, says the government is trying to tackle the issue. Well, net migration is far too high. This is placing intolerable pressure on public services, on housing supply and our ability to integrate people into our country. The Conservative Party has made a promise to reduce net migration and we're absolutely determined to do that. Well, we've made a very significant intervention this week which will make a tangible difference reducing the number of student dependents that come to our universities because universities should be in the education business, not the immigration business. Well, the shadow immigration minister, Stephen Kinnock, says government policy is to blame for the rise in numbers. Numbers are too high. They need to come down. Uh, the reason they've lost control is because they failed to do enough to invest in skills and talent and career development here in the UK. Uh, so employers are being forced to reach for overseas uh, migrant labour because they don't have the pipeline of people that are ready to come and work uh, and attracted as well to uh, the opportunities uh, that are here in the UK. Well, in other news today, Rishi Sunak has welcomed the reduction in the energy price cap, describing it as a major milestone towards his goal of halving inflation. Ofgem has announced the typical annual household energy bill will fall to a maximum of £2,074 a year from July. That's a drop of £426. Ofgem says the first price drop in 18 months reflects recent falls in wholesale energy prices. Nine people have been arrested over the disorder in Cardiff that followed the deaths of two teenagers on Monday evening. 16-year-old Kyrie Sullivan and 15-year-old Harvey Evans were killed in the Ely area of the city while riding an e-bike. The police watchdog is investigating after CCTV footage emerged showing a police van following the teens before their deaths. Fifteen officers were injured and cars were set alight and windows smashed in the violence that followed. All nine people remain in custody on suspicion of rioting. The First Minister of Scotland has welcomed the Police Chief Constable's statement describing the force as institutionally racist. Speaking at a meeting of the Scottish Police Authority, Sir Ian Livingstone said people from different backgrounds are not receiving the service they should. His comments come just days after the force announced plans to enlist thousands of officers to stamp out discrimination. Humza Yousaf says racism within Police Scotland is unacceptable and he'll do everything possible to dismantle it. There is no doubt that institutional racism exists in our society. And I uh, want to take a moment just to say that as a person of colour, the statement from the Chief Constable is monumental, historic. Uh, I remember raising issues around racism uh, in the police force, Strathclyde Police as it was back then, when I was stopped and searched over a dozen times as a young boy. Now, in international news, the Wagner 
mercenary group have started withdrawing from the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, handing over its positions now to Russian forces. Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, announced the capture of the eastern city five days ago after one of the longest and bloodiest battles of the war. Ukraine's deputy defence minister has confirmed that regular Russian troops have started replacing Wagner forces on the outskirts of the devastated city. Their mercenaries, however, do remain inside Bakhmut. And police in Portugal have confirmed the searches near a reservoir in relation to the disappearance of Madeleine McCann have now officially concluded. Portuguese, German and British officers have been investigating a remote area near the Algarve Coastal Resort where Madeleine McCann went missing in 2007. A source close to the investigation says there's nothing to report after three days of searches. The authorities will now take any materials found to Germany for testing. You're up to date on TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and the TuneIn app. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Thanks, Polly. I'm Michelle Drubry with you till 7 o'clock tonight. Daniel Moylan, the peer in the House of Lords, is with me, as is Aaron Bastani, the founder of Navara Media. And not just us three, of course, tonight, you at home. What is on your mind? Get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.com is the email address. Or you can tweet me at gbnews. Now, as you've just been hearing there, something that just happened in the last hour or so, uh, a man has been arrested after his car hit the main gates of Downing Street. Armed officers there arrested him on suspicion of criminal damage and dangerous driving. There were no injuries, apparently. Prime Minister uh, Rishi Sunak was there, but with all the latest, Darren McCaffrey. Good evening, Darren. What, what more can you tell us? Yeah, very good evening, uh, Michelle. Normality is somewhat returning here to Whitehall, to the centre of government. After, as you say, at around 4.20 this afternoon, a car collided, that's the word that the Metropolitan Police have used, with the main gate of Darning Street. Uh, a man was uh, very quickly arrested. Uh, looking at social media, he appears to be a middle-aged uh, white man. And that he has and been arrested. He's been questioned by the police, but no one was injured in the incident. Now, if you look through the footage that has appeared on social media time and time again over the last couple of hours or so, the car did not ram the gates of Darling Street. In fact, it seemed to move effectively from this end here of Whitehall. So you can see the traffic travels in each direction back and forth. But it came from the other gates. Those are the gates of the Ministry of Defence drove probably about three or four miles per hour, it seems, towards the, the gates of number 10 at uh, Downing Street, to the point where the police didn't seem uh, that they were going to treat this, and we've seen this since, as if it was a major incident. Was it deliberate or not? That will be clearly one of the decisions and one of the investigations the police will be looking into. As you say, the Prime Minister was in Darling Street at the time. Footage again from social media shows that his motorcade seemed to have left Darling Street shortly after the incident. Clearly, there would have been concerns about the motivation of what happened today. But very much this feels like an isolated incident with one man arrested, being questioned by police. No one was injured. And even though we can't get as close as you normally could get to Darling Street, uh, things, as you can see, with the traffic and people being able to move around are back to relative normality here. Uh, it's quite difficult to try and judge what the motivation might have been or indeed whether this was deliberate at all in the first place, given the speed at which the car was driving. But in the end, as I say, it appears to be an isolated incident, police not treating it as a major incident. Uh, but clearly at the time when it happened, there would have been quite a lot of concern. Thanks for that uh, update, Darren. I'll leave you to it. Um, I have to say, I was looking at this unfolding on social media and the like, so I've seen lots of clips of what's occurred. And, um, you know, descriptions such as a car rammed, a car smashed, uh, 
all this kind of stuff. So it was quite uh, refreshing then to hear uh, Darren kind of describe it act accurately as it was, because I looked at it, and I hope this is not going to be my Michael Fish moment. Remember when he predicted things wrongly? But to me, it just looked like some fella had taken a wrong turn. And I looked at that, and I thought, you're going to be in trouble with your missus when you get home tonight, love. Look at the uh, carnage that you've created in and among the media and social media and the like. Uh, anyway, what do you make to it? Well, I rather agree with you. It looks like a little bit damn squib, doesn't it? I mm. mean, you know, small earthquake in Chile, not many hurt. A uh, car drives very slowly in, into gates that are very strong, and those gates would see off a much bigger vehicle going at a, a, at a higher speed. Um, and, um, uh, and no great damage done. I mean, it might be a bit. Uh, nobody hurt. Um, car still left there for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe mainly so that we can sit and talk about it, probably. Well, that might be it, you see. Aaron? Well, maybe one of these many repeat offenders we have in uh, the House of Parliament, not, of course, our uh, established and esteemed uh, Lord Morland Hibbs, some of the MPs, perhaps they could have a community service order and have to repaint the gates. Honestly, though, I can just uh, imagine someone sitting at home watching the news go, hang on a minute, that's Brian, that's our Brian's car, that's our Brian, what's he doing? He's only supposed to be picking up his dry cleaning and look at him, he's all over telly. I can imagine that going on. Anyway, jokes aside, uh, very glad, of course, that nobody was injured uh, in that situation. But for now, I shall leave that there. If there are any developments, uh, you will be the first to hear about it. Worry not. But shall we just move on to our top story tonight? Back in 2004, when the EU expanded, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, had the not-so-bright idea to immediately open up the UK labour market to our newfound friends. The prediction was top end would get about, I don't know, an additional annual net migration increase of about 13,000. What actually happened was something which changed the fabric of the UK, I would argue, forever. The predictions were completely catastrophic. I mean, they were wrong by a factor of 10. In other words, you know, it wasn't 13,000, it was something like 130,000. And towns and cities changed, and surprise, surprise, wages were battered. Thanks, of course, to the advent of things like the cheap polished plumbers and the like, and if anyone dared to raise so much as an eyebrow about any of this, you got this. Good, and it's very nice to see you. Take care. Thanks, Gordon. That was a disaster. What did she say? Oh, everything. She's just a sort of bigoted woman that said she used to be late. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yep, that was our very own then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, calling you a bigot. Remember that? Gillian Duffy? Oh, well, <laughs> never mind. The Tories were soon on the case with promises like this. We would like to see net immigration in the tens of thousands rather than the hundreds of thousands. I don't think that's unrealistic. That's the... Well, since then, we've had promises and promises and promises, and we've had a Brexit referendum, if you ask me, in a massive part, a reaction to the aftermath of 2004. We can take back control, we were promised. Alas, once again, these promises turned out to be pie in the sky. Why? Well, at a time when, let's face it, pretty much nothing uh, in the UK works. We can pick a single example of the health sector. It's now impossible to get a doctor's appointment, isn't it? I and mean, you're more likely to see the Loch Ness monster than you are a dentist. But nonetheless, it emerged today that in the past year alone, our population has swelled by a massive and a record 606,000 thanks to net migration. That's more, by the way, than the population of Manchester. For context, that figure in 1997, when Blair came into power, was just 48,000. And in the understatement of the century... Numbers are too high. It's as simple as that, and I want to bring them down. Yes, Rishi, you are indeed correct. Those numbers are too high. We need an immediate cap on immigration volume and for the wishes of your electorate to be respected. Fail and you will be voted out quicker than you were uh, not really voted in in the first place. And as you say, it's as simple as that. Isn't it? Do you think? A cap? Immigration? Yeah, I think we need to break down the figures a little bit. I think, first of all, you've got some like um, Ukraine and Hong Kong where we've reached out and said... You're welcome here because of the difficulties. That's quite a big chunk. We've got another chunk, which is um, students. And there we've really got to look at the question, you know, is our university sector a broken <coughs> model if it's dependent so heavily on foreign students and isn't doing enough for people at home? And the third big chunk is people coming here to work. And we're inviting them. I'm not criticising them. We're inviting them in. We're allowing them in. And we're doing it because business will not adjust to the Brexit mandate from the people. 
which was that you need to develop a different business model which is not dependent on constant supplies of cheap labour. You need to invest in skills, or I'll talk about the government investing in skills. Employers need to invest in skills. They need to invest in automation, and they need to invest in innovation. They need to realise that those days have gone, but instead the government has indulged them. And the Office for Budget Responsibility, which seems to be running the show since Liz Truss, they got rid of Liz Truss, their model demands higher <coughs> immigration because their model, their, 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 their wonky model, a bit like Neil Ferguson's wonky model, <laughs> um, the more immigration you put into it, the richer we all look. Uh, and that just isn't true. It might be true the country's a bit richer, but per head... We are not rich. That's right. Yeah. And as I was um, gently hinting at there, I do, I blame uh, a lot of the origins of this uh, back to that 2004 decision under the Blair government. And I think that actually changed uh, people's attitudes, if you like, because I think these days, if you dare raise an objection, Aaron, to um, whether it's mass migration, whether it's asylum seeking, whether it's trying to control your own borders, you are labelled racist, xenophobic, uh, bigoted, <laughs> etc. And it isn't that at all. It's people look at their communities, they look at the uh, strain and drain on things like the public uh, sectors, the health was one that I gave an example of, and, you know, they're not happy with it. That's not what they wanted, that's not what they voted for. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm sure some, some people are racist, but I would agree that the overwhelming majority of them won't be. Of course, some, some people in any society are racist uh, and bigoted. But to pick up on what you said a moment ago, you know, we heard from the IMF that the pro projections around growth in this country are going to be 0.4% this year, and Jeremy Hunt was going, wow, look! But it's important to say 600,000 people, what does that mean? It means our population is increasing by 0.9%. So on a per capita basis, we're getting poorer. And then to talk about the things you just mentioned, health service, absolutely. I would also add housing. Mm. You know, you're adding the population of Manchester to the country. We don't build enough houses as it is. It, it clearly is a problem, and I, I think you, you can't ignore that. Whether you're on the left or the right, it's clearly a problem. I'd want to sort of break it down a little bit, though. So, for instance, I would say, even if you think we should have immigration in the tens of thousands, today, in 2023 or 2024, the NHS will collapse. And as, as Lord Moylan hinted, our university system, our you know, HE, higher education in this country, will just not exist anymore. So I think it has to be done in a sensible way. And I think politicians have to be realistic and honest to the public. And they're not honest to the public. And finally, how they're not honest to the public is basically talking about small boats, when that is a tiny fraction of what's going on. The big issue here is with perfectly legal economic migration. And rather than say that, the Tories are talking about small boats, but realistically, 90% of that 600, well, more than actually, well, no, but let's say 90% of that 600,000 figure is here perfectly legally. And they can stop a lot of it, but they choose not to because of, like I say, the growth, the growth factors. One of the things that I found uh, interesting was my own reaction to this number of 600-odd thousand because um, I think there's been a lot of seeds planted, uh, a lot of conversations, a lot of dialogue and a lot of debate around expectations being closer to a million, so mm. 700 mm. to a million. Um, I think one of the policy think tanks or whatever they call themselves, that was the kind of uh, figure that they, were, that they were kind of projecting out there. So when I heard the news about 600 odd thousand, my initial reaction was, oh, that's not that bad. <laughs> And then I had to give my head a shake. I said, hang on a second, it is, it is absolutely that bad. And what's happened is we're very clear, uh, cleverly being sucked into this kind of, like, nudge, whatever you call it, or PR or something yeah, that's made us... Yeah, Yeah, mm. yeah but there's also the fact, yeah, it is you know, actually. Michelle, that these figures get revised. And usually the immigration figures are revised upwards, so we don't even know that the 600,000 is final. I mean, they, they do more work later and you'll come out with another figure, but nobody will be looking at it by then. And it might well be a higher figure. So, you know, we don't know where we are entirely. I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. It can't go on. Everybody agrees it can't go on. The question Do is they? whether... Uh, well, Do you think Robert that everyone Jenner... is united in that sense of actually... Where's Scott I think, Brinkman, I think it would be very way? difficult to see any political figure come out and say... That's true. Uh, ..come out and say on the telly tonight, 600,000 good, 700,000 better. Let's aim for 700,000. Nobody's going to be saying that. So they'll all agree that that figure is unsustainable. The question is whether they're willing to take the hard actions uh, that require that are needed to bring it down. And so far, we haven't seen any evidence of that. Now, we did see something from the government this week, whether that has any effect. 
Um, but I think they've got to go and actually engage with the businesses. And it's the business problem, the worker problem, rather than the student problem that really worries me. When you say we've seen something from the government, are you on about the dependence of the yeah, students? Yeah, the dependence of the students. Yeah, they kind of got out the gate quick with that one, didn't they, to try yeah. and uh, yeah. say. But um, what I found interesting is where is Suella Breverman? I mean, I've not heard of her. I'm just looking at her Twitter and I'm just checking myself. Has she actually been in touch on her own Twitter, commenting, commenting on any of this stuff today? She hasn't. I found that odd. Mm. Don't you? Well, because she can't make any political capital out of it. That's why all this grandstanding... And like I say, look, and I'm sure many viewers on GB News or people listening on DAB uh, really care about the small boats. I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't care about it. But there's a reason why Sola Breverman talks about that stuff, but not about the overwhelming majority of these numbers, which, like you say, are coming because of economic migration, legally, or students, or spouses, or children, or dependents yeah, what's, of Yeah, so what's of the of reason students. in your mind that she's doing that? Well, because fundamentally... The, the, the university system in this country, higher education, simply does not function without overseas students. There is not the money and the resources there to build all these big buildings for all the, the senior leadership and execs to get their big paychecks without foreign students. I mean, everybody is, has any relationship yeah, to higher education knows enough, that. I'm not that worried about their bonuses. Well, a lot of universities, so like, for instance... You no, know, I, I wouldn't please. mind if a few people didn't get bonuses at universities. Sure. I'm surprised people getting bonuses at universities anyway. It was always a labour of love. But I think there is a well, difference. That's not true. No, that's not true. There is an important difference. V vice principals are on four, five hundred thousand pounds. I know they are labour of love, yeah. In the good old days, it yeah. was labour of love. Sorry. Yeah. Do you care about the higher educational system? Do you think that that is almost like a, a small price to pay, if you like, for these big figures? Uh, what do you think the answer is? I do believe that you need to have some form of cap and you need to be doing that very, very quickly. But what would you cap? Who would you cap from? Where would you cap? And what would you do uh, about the potential skills shortage? Uh, speaking of which, a lot of people will say, well, you need these um, people to come over and do the jobs because British people won't do them. Well, why not? Are you one of those people that sit there and, for example, say, well, I'm not going out and picking fruit and veg and all the rest of it? Uh, why? Are we lazy? I don't know. You tell me. Uh, when I come back, another question that's on my mind tonight. Boris Johnson, a bit of hot water, as we already know. Some people are saying that uh, it's time to scrap his honours list. Other people saying, you know what? Scrap the whole honours system altogether. Where do you stand on it? See you in two. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, uh, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion. Looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubri with you until 7 o'clock alongside me, Daniel Moylan and Aaron Bastani keeping me company. Um, we shall come back and comment on uh, that top story there and the immigration one in just a couple of minutes, but I shall move on if you'll indulge me, because Boris Johnson, we know, don't we, he's all... I was going to say he's in trouble. He's always in trouble. When is somebody uh, leaving him alone? I don't know. He always seems to be doing something wrong. Anyway, uh, now what they're saying is that perhaps his uh, resignation honours list, basically, should be scrapped because of the allegations around Partygate, etc. Um... I'll start with you, because yeah. you are a lord, after all. Well, what do you think? Should his uh, resignation list be honoured? Well, I want to put this in context. Back in the days of the Roman Empire, which Boris knows all about, there was this thing called... You know the... that I go off air at seven, don't you? There, there's <laughs> this thing called damnation of memory, where one emperor would come in, and the first thing they'd do is they'd take the predecessor, unless it was the father, they'd take the predecessor and they'd scrap everything. Statues were smashed, the names were cut out of the inscriptions, and, and they put out all this propaganda, got the writers to write about what a terrible person he was, and so on. Right. And this is what we're seeing happening to Boris at the moment, and it's entirely political. And, and the idea that you then go for the people... These people are people who worked for the Prime Minister in Downing Street, most of them. I don't know who they are, I mean, I haven't seen the names. But a resignation honours list is normally people who worked for the Prime Minister. It goes right down to the cleaners and, you know, the, the security guards with different types of honours, and they're going to be punished because these people are so vicious about Boris that they'd like to punish them just because they hate him, and it needs to stop. Aaron? Well, I broadly agree. I think it's, it's a very slippery slope when we start to say that, oh, well, one Prime Minister's gone, their successor should basically undo some key decisions and, and not, you know, give favours the people that they favoured. I mean... We, we can't operate like that. So each Prime Minister successively would treat their, their predecessor like that. We have enough dysfunction in this country when it comes to politics that I think we, we probably shouldn't be adding to it at this point. I, I say dysfunction, enmity, um, discord. Why create more of that? I mean, I have criticisms more broadly of the honours list and how it functions. Um, and, I, for instance, David Cameron, I think, gave an OBE to his hairdresser, something like that. I think I probably don't think that's quite right. Well, it was a very good hairdresser. Yeah, but and also it's, it can be unfair to sort of criticise a broader thing because of one example. But in this case, I, I I agree. What was your qualification for being made a lord? I don't know. You have qualifications for being made lords because sometimes people are made lords as an honour. Like I came in with Ian Botham, and he was obviously being honoured for his cricket, cricketing skills, and he hasn't participated much in the work of the House of Lords. And the other people go in as working peers. And I went in as a working peer to do the work. I do do the work. It's a, it's a full-time job for me, for at least for a few years. And I suppose it's because Boris thought I was able to do it. And to be perfectly honest, I'm quite reasonably good at it. See, I I'd don't... rather enjoy it. I don't agree with this principle um, that people do their job and then they get uh, awarded this honour of whatever level uh, just for literally doing their job. Well, they might have done I... more than their job. You don't, haven't seen who's on the list yet. They well, I'm talking gone, about historically. You know, were talking about hairdressers. Well, I say he was a very good hairdresser. I might deserve an honour. Oh, come on, but, come on. I mean... I know I, you don't think that. So. I, I am struggling to take it seriously because I sit there, for example, Liz Truss, a woman that was in office for 44 days or whatever it was, there or thereabouts, she will get a resignation uh, yeah, list but, as well. Know, it's it's you, a little bit silly. The, you need to look at the whole picture. The whole honours system, which, in, which is... The, what the Prime Ministers get in their resignation honours is a tiny part of what's done in the New Year's honours and the Birthdays honours, when you have more than a 1,000 names coming out. Nearly, you know, huge numbers of no, them. No, I would get rid of all of it. Huge, I know you would, but you're wrong. Huge numbers of them That's are people right. who've worked in charity, who've worked in the local communities. They're from all parts of the country. It's one of the few things that does actually reach out very deliberately through the whole of the country. Um, it, it's, um, they're, or they're people sometimes very distinguished in their field, professors, people who've won Nobel Prizes and things like that. What is the, what is the harm 
in recognising them and giving them, giving them some sort of honour. It's some letters after the name. If it means nothing to you, you don't have to accept it. You can politely reply and say, I'd rather not have it. Um, and if it, does, if it does mean something... So how does it work, then? Fine. Maybe, I, maybe I've got a... Um, uh, maybe I'm not understanding the full picture. So if you're honoured to whatever level, can you then wander into your House of Lords and get your 300-odd pounds a day? No, uh, well, if you're made a, a member of the House of Lords and you turn up and work, you can earn the money that is paid to people for working. There's nothing strange about pay, pay, paying people for working. And you're entitled to do that. The number of people put into the House of Lords is a tiny fraction of the number of people who get MBEs, OBEs, CBEs, you know, very all big, of the... Th very big second chamber, though, All it? sorts of things only, like I think it's that. only... I think the that's... only second chamber that's bigger than us is China, isn't it? Well, I think that's their first chamber. It's... it's big... It's a bit bigger than the House of Commons. It's seven... It's nearly 800... High 700s. The House of Commons is 650. But the appointments are there for life. We might not like that, but that's no, what No, I definitely there for. don't like that. I think, there, it, I think that's they're there for life. And there's quite a lot of people who, as they get older, they don't turn up. And, and they're not contributing. Listen, so how uh... many do you need to do the job? You, you, uh, my reckoning is you need a minimum of 400 to do the job with all the legislation and the committees and so on. You need a minimum of 400 full-time equivalents. And in a place like the House of Lords, you need about 750 to get your 400 full-time equivalents. If you don't want that, have full-time politicians, pay them proper salaries, give them staff. We don't get any staff, we don't get secretaries or anything like that. Give them staff, give them proper offices and let them do that and then pay for it. Well, he's making the case uh, for the continuation of the system as it stands. I, I don't agree, I'm afraid. He didn't convince me. Did he convince you at home? He reckons I'm wrong. Am I? I don't know. I you're think not... you're wrong about people up and down the country. You said you didn't approve of people up and down the country who are working in charities and sometimes lollipop people, other people like, you know, all sorts of people and professors and people I like the way you said Nobel lollipop prizes. people, though, not lollipop lady, because I would have had an issue. You can't, uh, what's I'm, the word, stereotype these days. So I'm well very, done. very, very, very... Very I'm work. Very, very you are woke. very right on. The woke very right Tory on. lord. Yeah, exactly. I uh, said a lollipop, lollipop people, a I... lollipop people, <laughs> and you don't want them rewarded after years of holding, oh, holding that up. You don't want them to be recognised in their community. You don't want them to have their party and, you know, around the community centre having a party to celebrate their own. Listen, OBE. I am it's all for... But it, it gives people huge pleasure and a sense of reward and a sense of belonging. I'm good all for uh, recognising uh, contribution, decent, good uh, contributions, particularly uh, in the charity sector and all the rest of it. But this honours system, is that really the right way of doing it? Well, I don't you know. Do? You tell me. I'm going to ask my viewers. They're smart no, people, these right. guys. You okay, tell me. Right. Um, I have to take a break. I'll try and fix the problem. I'll try and give you a, a short uh, strategy in the break. But for now, <laughs> I will go to break because I want to bring you guys in after it. But I also want to ask you as well about artificial intelligence. Do you even know what that is? You might hear a sentence, but what is it? Uh, some people say it is a fantastic development for uh, mankind. Other people say, careful what you wish for. What have you done? What do you make to it, Stephen Two? It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now, and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel, and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness 
to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubri, keeping you company till 7 o'clock. Daniel Moylan is a peer in the House of Lords alongside me, as is Aaron Bastani, the founder of Navara Media. We were just talking about the honour system. I was just saying it should be scrapped. So I was asking you guys what you think. Dave says, please don't scrap them. My father was awarded during the course of his RAF career. Uh, an R an AFC and a CBE. I am extremely proud of him, Michelle. Um, I will confess, though, as well, in the break, Daniel was saying that he can write a letter and nominate me. So I take it all back, everything that I've just said, uh, don't scrap anything, don't cancel any of it, because actually, what would I be? A lady, yeah. Dame? Yeah, we'll what? make you Dame, Michelle. Yeah, we'll oh, write, yeah. We, we need to get lots of people writing in. Dame Jubilee. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Dame Everyone, Michelle. I take it all back, don't scrap it, get your letters in, Dame Jubilee. Um, yeah, fantastic ring to it. I'll get my business cards printed up in uh, <laughs> an anticipation. In I'll do a Rishi Sunak, I'll get the domain uh, purchased, I'll get everything ready to go, I'll have a whole uh, thank you speech all ready to go, uh, as though I'd kind of planned it or somehow. Nigel says all of these things should be limited uh, and, should, and most of them should need to be approved by both major political parties. David says, Michelle, if you need to know how wrong the system is, just uh, focus on the fact that Tony Blair uh, was knighted instead of imprisoned for his war crimes. Yeah. He says the honours are an absolute jerk. Uh, lots of you guys getting in touch as well about the immigration thing. Um, lots of you supporting the uh, caps we've just been discussing. Uh, Bernard saying, yes, it was Labour under Blair. That was the point that I was trying to make uh, that really kind of changed uh, things when it comes to numbers. Kevin says, I'm not buying this whole student thing. That is just an excuse. Um, Surprise, surprise. Who is surprised? Asked John. Nobody at all. Well, I was a bit surprised that they was lower than I was anticipating. Uh, but anyway, I suspect that is a good thing. Let's talk artificial intelligence, shall we? Uh, do you even know what that is? It gets uh, branded around that term quite a lot these days, doesn't it? There's been lots of conversations. Uh, the Prime Minister, he's been meeting some of the bosses of some of the biggest AI groups to talk about safety and regulation and all the rest of it. Um, Aaron, you are a man that knows a thing or two about this subject, uh, not least because of a book that I know that you've written. Uh, artificial intelligence, where do you stand on it? It's a big deal. And for your audience out there, I want to say that there's two kinds of artificial intelligence we need to sort of think about here. The first is what people call an AGI, artificial general intelligence, this idea of being an existential threat. So people have seen The Matrix or Skynet and Terminator. I've never seen uh, any of those. You know? OK. So the idea of an all-powerful machine capable of augmenting its own intelligence, you know, superhuman intelligence, Park that, because it might not happen, but that's the thing that they're talking about with regards to existential risk. Something else, however, which is far more relevant to everyday lives, is what's called machine learning. And that's the kind of artificial intelligence which is coming for basically any job which is repetitive and relies on lots of information, which can range from driving with self-driving cars, well, that's a long way off, to things like accountancy, legal services. So AI, whether or not we get the sci-fi style, you know, killer um, artificial intelligence, AI is going to have massive implications for 
ordinary people across this country for decades to come. Yes, yeah, I really think that it is. And I think a lot of people, I think it's one of those topics, because being honest, most people or a lot of people, they don't really get it, they don't really understand it. And why would they, by the way? Um, so when you when you kind of introduce a topic like this, I think sometimes people's eyes glaze over, they'll go, who cares, what is that all about? But actually, uh, to your point, to me, this represents the beginning of a fundamental shift in mm. society. I'm actually quite worried. Mm. I, I'm not a, a Luddite, I'm not anti-evolution, uh, but I do, I sit there, and I think it was the, the godfather of AI, one of the creators of it, even he had said mm. he regrets uh, his role, he regrets what he's potentially created. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the story of Frankenstein, aren't we? And I wonder if we're kind of tiptoeing into that kind of arena uh, in some regards. What do you make to it all, Daniel? Well, I think we we're getting a bit hysterical about it. It. I mean, I mean, I found Aaron's distinction very helpful. Um, there's lots of um, AI going on already. I mean, it may be a while off with um, driving cars, but your trains on the London Underground, most of them now are driven by a computer. It's not by the driver. Uh, all he does is open and close the doors, and the train drive, the, the computer decides how fast the train is going and um, uh, when it stops and things like that. Um, that's already happening, uh, and I think that's a good thing on the whole. The um, question, though, of the, you know, are we all going to be living in the Matrix and we're sort <laughs> of... We're sort of um, experimental creatures in a jam jar while su huge super intelligences have created themselves and, and persecutors or enslavers so don't or wash whatever with you. else it might be. Well, I don't expect to be around for it, to be honest, or even Aaron, or you, Michelle, who's the youngest of us all. Well, um, but um, I don't think we'll be around for it. I'm not too worried about it. People tend to get a bit hysterical. I am surprised, I have to admit, on what Aaron said, that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, on this day of all days, um, uh, has found time to go and off and discuss this um, distant, horrendous fantasy. Well, yeah, see, I might take record this and remind you of it in a few years to come, but have a look at this. Let me see if I can get this up on the screen. Uh, if you're listening, not watching, I shall describe it to you. Is it there? Otherwise, I'm just looking. Right, so... I've got these in the wrong order. They've, they've ruined the best of my bubble, everybody. I was building up to this. I was building up to it. Um, it's probably not going to work because I think my order's all mixed up. But anyway, I used AI to depict you, Lord Moylan. Oh, yeah? There you are. No, it's not actually me. No, I know it's not you. It's no. the artificial intelligence version of you. It it's took not, me a few iterations. It's so bloody good, is it? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> well, if, that, if that's keep, AI, yeah, you keep can these get it. flowing. It's all messed up now. My order's all messed up, but keep it flowing, and you will see. So look, there you go. Oh, that's pretty good. That was another iteration of you. Um, I think I've got one to show you how it started. My first one when I tried to develop you in AI. Have I got the next one? There you go. That was one. Another one. Right, I so don't what think I've got the original one. With Hang the on. Photograph. Cool, this is. If these things move any slower, I'll still be here into Nigel Farage's <laughs> show. Like, try, let's try rattling through them, shall we? That was you. Oh, very Aaron Bastani. Oh, Look I, at that. I, well, maybe, maybe oh. 10 years what ago. A, what a handsome, dapper man. Maybe, Look at that. Maybe 10 years then ago. Then I tried to do another one of you. Look, that was you. That's more that, like me now. Isn't that accurate? Yeah, my late, yeah, my late 30s. That's yeah, more like it. That is what? accurate. And then, hang on. And then look at this, everyone. Ready? The piece de resistance. Are you ready? Come on, everyone. That's all. Oh, do you know? I give up. <laughs> I give up. I don't know what these you guys need, are doing. I don't want to put producers was not the... producer at the job, but I mean, AI could, I guys. Know, this AI could, would, uh, AI could AI would do this. Right, have I got that final picture or not? This was like the, this was like the uh, thing that was going to knock you all off your feet. You was going to go, wow, look at it. Ah, oh, can't get the staff. This is AI. This is where you need AI, everybody, because I did have something to show you, and I will be honest, it kind of knocked me off my uh, stride a little bit. I did, I looked at it, I was like, absolutely, wow. I'll try and show it to you a little bit later on, try and get it to you before 7 o'clock. But anyway, let me know your thoughts when it comes to artificial intelligence. Are you a fan of it? Do you think it is going to help uh, society or hinder it? You get in touch with me and tell me. I'll see you in two.
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubri. This is Jubes & Co. with you till 7 o'clock tonight. Daniel Moylan is the peer in the House of Lords and Aaron Bastani is the founder of Navara Media. We've just been talking about artificial intelligence. One of my viewers, Lee, has said, it. Michelle, never mind some of this stuff that you're talking about, the real worry that you need to be focused across, he says, is the whole digitisation of banking. You know, today I got an actual letter a letter, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember those things, pen and paper? From one of my viewers, you might be watching tonight, actually, you were saying to me that you're starting to feel excluded from society because you want to pay cash. You and your wife, you're telling me that you can't go to the theatre because you don't want to book online, you don't want to use your cards, uh, and you're struggling to find places that will accept your cold, hard cash. Many of you pointing out things like digital currencies and all the rest of it. Uh, you're smart folk, you are, and I think you're absolutely right. And Anthony uh, says, Michelle... Um, what on earth was that artificial segment, intelligence segment about? None of the pictures looked anything like your guess. Um, so it's a little bit rubbish. We'll take a look at this. Look at that. Who's that, ladies and gentlemen, on the screen? Brilliant. Who is it? Oh, I... I am going to get rid of my panel as well at this rate. You're supposed to. It's oh, it's Michelle, it's yes. you. Even, you know what, even, the way, even the way that you're, you are holding that item, that's even how you hold your phone. Right, so Crazy. ladies and gentlemen, right, let me explain something to you. If I can get that image up again, right? That image was created, and I've got to say, and I don't mean ego, uh, to be egotistical in this, but I actually think that is very similar to me. It knocked my socks off. That was the first attempt, and all I asked for was show me Michelle Jubilee reading the news. 
And that's what it came up with. I thought yeah. it was absolutely brilliant. So, yes, I concede that the variations uh, of the ones that I did of Daniel and Aaron were not that great. But what you've got to realise about AI, a lot of it is all about, you know, it takes the information and then it kind of, it'll grow and grow and grow and grow and grow based on what it already mm. knows. So the more it gets to know, Lord Moylan mm. and uh, you, if the more If we're as famous accurate. as you, then we were as famous yeah, as you. Yeah, I mean, if you, you are, if you were at the dizzy heights of the A-list like me, yeah. what yeah. can I say, then you'd have exactly. more accurate imagery. Um, but anyway, it did, I saw that image and I had to do a double take because I honestly did think, I sit like that, I drink my, I, I drink like that. Mm. Uh, I've got a massive forehead like that as well. And my I glasses, thought that was a bit unfair, actually. Yeah. Oh, the big forehead. That was a bit too. That was. A, was a, it a bit extreme? It was unfair. All oh, right. Okay. Well, anyway, I thought it was absolutely great. So that's why I showed you that. And uh, when it comes to losing your jobs, by the way, uh, one of the <laughs> jobs that I did, I used to be a checkout girl. That one, of course, no longer because you've got things like your self checkout, haven't you? Uh, anyway, civil service, has it gone too far in its war against the government that some people are calling it? Uh, it's all been going on, hasn't it? You've got leaks here, there and everywhere, um, which always fascinates me. How are civil servants allowed to go running off to the press every five seconds to report something that they don't like? How is that even possible? Well, we know how it's possible and it's very difficult to stop. The question is why are they doing it? And they're doing it because they've lost all sense of their own constitutional position and responsibility. And, and it is this very serious threat to how we govern the country. It means the civil service can effectively choose the government. And then we have people demanding, and we agree, that it should be done. So in the House of Commons, for example, they're going to introduce this measure whereby if you have a complaint made, a serious complaint made against you, you'll be banned from the House. Previously, you had to wait until you were charged before you were banned mm. from the House. Now it's just a matter of having a complaint made. So one complainant can actually ruin somebody's career cut them off from doing their representative role on behalf of their constituents properly, prevent them from speaking in the House. That would be... They haven't decided it yet, but that's what they're proposing in a month's time. What do you think to that, Aaron? It's very interesting, particularly because, as somebody on the left, I've always had concerns about if you did have a, a radical left-wing Labour government, which I don't think we're going to be seeing with Keir Starmer, by the way, and I'm sure he'd be very happy to hear me say that, reassure some people out there, one of the big challenges would be, I think, the civil service. If you wanted to say, right, we want to bring X, Y, Z into public ownership. Even, even things that people support, like water. Most Tory voters want water back into public ownership. Well, I, think I don't know why. They should look at Scotland. It's no better in Scotland. Yeah, but, well, we can part of that. Yeah, I mean, all right, yeah, we'll part that. That's for another day. We can, yeah, another show. Note to self, another it, day. It's not going away. But in any case... Um, in any case, I think the civil service would make life far more difficult than it needs to be. I think, basically, there is an aversion to big overhauls, um, top-down overhauls, trying to solve big problems. Clearly, in the case of the last several years, that's in reference to Brexit. Yeah. There, was a, there is a resistance to trying to solve some of the bigger problems. Now, I'm not poo-pooing on the civil service or individuals. I think that's just how the, the civil service works. It's like a big ship, and you try and turn it around, and it takes a really long time. But I think, at the same time... We are seeing, I think, something a little bit new. So in regards to Priti Patel, who's mentioned here, and Sula Breverman, I personally think they've both broken the ministerial code. Sula Breverman is the live case, obviously. There are very clear codified lines and principles that you should adhere to when you're talking to foreign governments, basically. And she should have disclosed her previous relationship to Rwanda before she was becoming before she was an MP, she should have disclosed that uh, when she became an MP, and particularly when um, sh she proposed the Rwanda scheme. So I think that's kind of moot. The one that interests me is not mentioned here is Dominic Raab, because I do think there probably was a case of some people not particularly liking him and him mm -hmm. being taken out. And I, I don't think that's right. Now, I don't know... Th that might be not be true. We don't know the full case. But from what I've seen, some of the complainants um, don't quite... don't really seem particularly strong. Others do. It seems very serious. But others don't. And I think... There probably was a bit of a snowball with Rob to get rid of him. And I think that's a concern, because whether or not you like individual politicians or governments, they have a democratic mandate. They're elected by the people. They're not chosen by NGOs or civil servants or journalists. They're chosen by the electorate. And I think we're in a very dangerous place now where several thousand people, broadly in central London, get to determine who is and who isn't the government. I think that's very dangerous. Very, very quickly, just yes or no. Carol's asking, can you ask the Lord a question? Uh, does the Official Secret Act apply to the civil uh, service or not? Yeah. 
Yeah, there you yeah, go. Something like that. There you go. The senior ones. Uh, not, anyway, not look, time flies. Mark is appreciating the debate with you. Before I go very quickly, did you see Just Stop Oil uh, getting into their antics of the Chelsea flower show today? Have I got a clip of it? Uh, it really caught my eye. There they are, choosing their events carefully that they go to. Anyway, uh, I've been looking at the uh, traditional British events calendar, so I have. And if anyone from Just Stop Oil is watching and they need a recommendation, uh, in less than two weeks' time, it starts on the Thursday, the 8th of June, the Appleby Horse Fair uh, takes place. I'm sure uh, they will be delighted to hear your message. Uh, spread it as far and wide. Interesting. Anyway, that's all we have got time for. Aaron and Daniel, thank you for your company. Thank you at home. Like I said, they're appreciated. Uh, the respectful debate, that's what we try and do uh, on Jubes and Co. Even if Daniel does think I'm completely wrong on what I think. Anyway, I'll leave it with you. Have a fantastic evening. Do not go anywhere. If you're going out, get your radio switched on. Take us with you because Nigel Farage is up next. And I suspect he might have something to say about the immigration figures 606,000. Goodness me. See you tomorrow. Good evening. I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather forecast from the Met Office for GB News. Tomorrow, the day after, and the day after that will be dry and fine with sunny spells for most. Pleasantly warm by day, but some um, chilly at night. High pressure is very slowly creeping in. These weather fronts are going to change things a little bit across northern Scotland over the next couple of days. But for the vast majority, under the influence of high pressure, it stays dry and fine. There's some patches of cloud around at the moment. They'll tend to break up a little overnight. Might turn a little misty. One or two fog patches are possible through the early hours. And there's the cloud I talked about earlier, increasing across the northwest of Scotland. Through more northern parts of the mainland of Scotland, we could get down close to freeze generally down to uh, single figures, maybe 10 or 11 where we keep it a bit more cloud. Some will start a bit grey then on Friday, but for most it will be another fine day with bright sunny spells. Cloud increasing all the while in the western Isles of Scotland. Bit of drizzle here and by lunchtime we could see a few spots arriving over the highlands. But uh, for much of Scotland and certainly England, Wales, Northern Ireland, dry and fine with sunny spells. Quite warm as well, temperatures getting into the high teens, low 20s more widely. Always a bit cooler on some coasts with a bit of a breeze blowing and cooler with that thicker cloud across the far north of Scotland, still providing the odd spot of rain over the Northern Isles during Friday evening. But for most, a fine Friday evening and looking like a fine and dry Saturday. Again, northern Scotland seeing more cloud and there will be a little bit of rain trickling in here as a weather front moves in. But for most places, sunny spells on Saturday and again feeling pleasant in the sunny spells after a bit of a cool start by the afternoon. We'll be up into the low 20s more widely. Again, some of the beaches will be a little cooler and it will be cooler in northern Scotland because this line of patchy rain is a weather front. That will introduce things uh, turning cooler for more of us during the second and half of the weekend, but still, for most of us, staying dry with sunny spells. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's 